Whatever device you have, you know how we do it. Lift it up and repeat after me. This is my sword. I live by it. I trust its author. And I believe its content. Now with a firm voice, say, Lord, I thank you for your word. Now if you don't mind, give God a great praise offering for his word today. It will never fade or spoil. We have the, the word of God. We thank you on today. So as you know, we're in the series uh, here in 1 Corinthians, um, church or culture, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? And on today, we will be in chapter number 10. Again, it is a great thing to be in a book study because you know where we are as the next weeks come, right? So you're already reading up on it. So I know you are prepared uh, to engage in the conversation for today. Uh, so we'll be in chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, or as far as we can get on today. All right. Um, so a as we fully commit ourselves to Jesus, uh, we know by now in our, on our salvific journey that it's more than just accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. There's more to it than this. Um, this journey uh, has called for all of us to solely and completely submit ourselves to, to the authority of Jesus Christ. Wholeheartedly submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so it, it, it's more than just an emotional decision. It is one decision and a daily choice that we make. To follow Jesus, as my grandmother would say, all the way. Yeah. Right, 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 all, all the way. Uh, yet, yet there is something that I would contend to put on out to your heart today that we have to be aware of is our environment. Because we can choose Jesus to be Lord, Savior, and friend. Yet if we don't make that decision with a choice of a better environment and how we perceive the environment, it makes our decision to make Christ our Lord that much harder. Your environment is important. How you perceive the environment is important. And as we look at this church in Corinth and the environment in which they live, uh, they made the choice not to separate from that environment. They made the choice because we, ha as we read the things that the culture was doing, they started doing those things in the church. When we give our lives to Christ, listen, there has to be a separation from our decisions to be worldly and cultural to our decisions to own Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, I understand because many of us, we, we believe that, that we, we hold on, rather, to the process of salvation, and we give ourselves a pass because it's a process. And I get you. I'm, I understand it is a process. Yet in the process, you have to make a good decision. In the process, you have to make a very wise decision about where you settle your hips in the process. You got to make a wise decision about where you put yourself, the company that you keep while in the process, because if you don't make a wise decision about the process, the process can overtake you. And listen, let me put this on the altar of your heart. We are contending with the idea for many believers, not you because you're here on Sunday, but many folks are out there believing um, that you can walk an easy line of being holy and unholy at the same time. Listen, it's a choice you make every day. Every opportunity that comes your way, you have been offered a choice. To do life God's way or to do it based on your own regard. In this chapter, chapter number 10, uh, Paul is dealing with specifically the idea of idols and our appreciation and the worship of those idols. Um, so we're going to jump into this. And the title of our simple speech this morning is The Problem with an Idolatrous Church. The 
problem with an idolatrous church. So I believe that God has allowed us, you and I as believers, to experience what, what, what I would consider an opportunity for a spiritual awakening, an opportunity for a spiritual renewal, an opportunity for a spiritual revival where God shakes us to get our attention. He shakes us through the environment, through circumstances around us in order to get our attention, and he has to get our attention. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because we have, we have fastened our eyes on icons. Instead of having our eyes fastened on he who is God. We have allowed ourselves to, be, to become victim of the things that this temporary land provides to us through the grace of God, and we have taken our eyes off of the provider who is God himself. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. I'm jotting down Romans chapter 1, verse number 25. Paul writes this in Romans 1, 25. He says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Listen, before we take a finger and start shaking it at this church of Corinth, we got to shake it at ourselves too because we have taken the things of the blesser and made the blessings more important than the blesser. We have allowed ourselves to allow our eyes and our hearts to hold fast to the provisions of God and take our eyes off of the provider. Listen, we, we, we have to deal with this and I been trying to work hard to get my mind right because I got to deal with it because it's the next passage to, re to read right got got I'm not gonna skip chapters right so we got to deal with this because because many of us are literally on a live struggle bus when it comes to idols oh yeah and a hush it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a live struggle bus because many of us when we see idols we, we take our mind to, to those people who have little chunky um, Buddhas in their windows and those people who wear certain things and they hold certain pieces of jewelry higher than others. We, we, we see idols and idolical worship as those people. Them over there. And we're not really looking at our hearts when it comes to idolatrous living. Uh, because do you know that it is possible to to worship your body? And many of us in here will say, Rev, you're right. They ought not do that. Yeah, we ought not do that. Because it, it's not the point of that. The, the person that goes to the gym every day sees his or her body in an idolatrous state. You know, it's many of us because we make selection of clothes based on the size of our hips. And we want to accentuate everything that God has given us. Well, that's just as much idolatry as me showing off God's provisions as me going to the gym every day, showing off my God's provisions, looking in the mirror. It's all the same. We can't let our bodies become an idol. Well, how about this one? We can't let our church become an idol. As if to say, if it doesn't happen through the valve of one church, then, then, then it may not be God. If I don't get Pastor Mac's permission, no, no, you don't need the church's permission to be holy. You don't need the church's permission to, to do right according to God's word. Your body, even your church. You see, we have a real problem with the church because once we get into everybody's system, our logo, our, you know, our brand, it's got to come from the brand. Of, no, man, that's idolistic. No, our obedience is to God and not the local church. Now, Romans is real clear to us. There's an order in how things happen at the, for the church. But you are the pastor of your own life. And if you're not doing your part, don't blame anybody else. You got to turn your eye away from the idol of your body, away from the idol of the church, and keep your eye on God. As a matter of fact, some of us have made leadership an idol. Well, if that, I, I'm a, well, let me call Pastor Mac. Don't call me. Don't call Tyrone because you can't use my phone. 
we must spend some time making sure we are invested in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are moved by the only supernatural worship guide, and that is the Holy Spirit. So not only must we be careful that our bodies don't become an idol, the church doesn't become an idol, the leader doesn't become an idol, but listen, even the Bible can become an idol. <laughs> oh, Lord. And some of the real saints got up. Hold on, Reverend. Hold on, Reverend. Hold on, Reverend. Listen, 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 listen. If the Bible, since we believe the Bible is about one person, that means we can't be so in love with the source that we don't forget about the source of the source. You see, the Bible is about Jesus. So I'm not going to fall in love with the Bible and miss Jesus. You see, you can learn certain sections of Scripture and miss Jesus. It must be Christ and Christ alone. It's, it's idolatric, idolatrous worship, everybody. It's when we remove the presence of Christ and put in the place of Christ an idea, a person, a system, or a place. In any shape, form, or fashion, you cannot put a person, a place, a thing, an idea where Christ is supposed to be. And whenever we do that, we are now victims of idolatrous worship. So even your marriage can become an idol. Even your children, your grandchildren, your great grands can become an idol. And listen, saints and friends, it's not the issue of the stuff. The issue is your heart and your perception. You see, we oftentimes want God to remove us out of places. God doesn't need to remove us, just change your heart. Because where we are today, many of us have misplaced a testing of God with the temptation of the culture. We don't understand God testing us and temptation of the world. You see, James is really clear in James 1 that God does not tempt us, right? So temptation comes from an unnatural source. It is our flesh that longs for certain things, and we're only tempted by what we already have a heart for. You see, God will allow a test to happen, and our tests come to make us stronger. But because our hearts are not right, we want God to get us out of the test. God is testing us for his purpose. And even in this chapter, we're going to see in verse 13 that God has given us even a way out of the temptation. But we have to want to accept it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So let's look at the, the verses right here. Verses 1 through 6 says this. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all hate, I mean, excuse, they all ate, excuse me, the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So here's our prevailing question for the morning. How do we prevent idolatry from becoming our normal? How do we prevent our idolatry from becoming our normal? So let me say this. Let me lean in with me that whatever we become connected to didn't automatically happen the first time we experienced it. It took some time for us to develop this, this taste for certain things. Whatever it is, you know, whatever it is, I keep telling y'all my business. When I first started eating bluebell ice cream, I'd eat all bluebell like I, like I started eating later on in life. It took me a while. Then I, it didn't take me that long because it tastes really that good. Bluebell, the best ice cream in the country. Boy, y'all. Um, but whatever it is that we have become victim of, 
a process of us acquiring and loving the taste of it, we then became victim of loving the taste. So whatever sin that is that has captured your heart or your mind, you just didn't fall in it all of a sudden. But the problem is we have made idolatry normal. We have made a heart to satisfy our own desires normal. James talks about the, the lust of the eyes, the flesh. It's normal now. Sin doesn't even bother us like it used to anymore. Why? Because it has been normalized. It's normal. That's just what they do, Red. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's because it's what they do don't make it right, and you ought to have a problem with it. I mean, it, it, but we, we have to learn how not to allow idolatrous worship to become our norm. Okay, so now I've already stated the fact that idolatry is when you replace Christ with any person, place, thing, idea. You can't replace Christ. And here's one way we can learn not to replace it. It's right there in the text. Here it is. Learn from the past. Learn from the past. You see, many of us, if we're not careful, we're, we're too smart for our own good. I told y'all when I got to, when I was in college, they, they changed how you do algebra. When I got to college, and I finally took it took me a long time. I was trying to run from you can't run. Everybody's going to college, you can't run from algebra, okay? So I ran from it as many times, many semesters as I could. And by the time I did sign up for algebra, you had to start using a computer to do it. Look, calculator. And I said to myself, and I told my professor, I said, Prof, I have already figured out how to do it. He said, well, your figuring may be okay, but it's not right, according to the syllabus. <laughs> you see, many of us are smart because we have gone through some things. Every now and then, God wants us to learn from the defeats of others so that we don't continue the same process in today. So that means you've got to sell your hip sometime and read a book. So you can learn what not to do. Now listen, Paul sees Israel and Egypt as the church in Corinth in Corinthians. Right? Two lost groups of people who say they love God but in the process of loving God, lose their focus. Now, can I add a third? We got Israel. You got Egypt. Israel in Egypt. You got church of Corinth there uh, in Corinthians. You got the church of America in America. Three different ideas. Same game plan. We have seen God do miraculous things. Yet we find ourselves moment after moment questioning, well, is he going to do it again? As if God has to continue to prove himself to be God to any one of us. And shame on all of us if we're expecting God to do one more thing today. Well, that was yesterday. Let me prove, let what you go, Lord, if, Lord, if you turn, the, if, you, if, you, if, it's text, if you take the heat down, uh, the humidity, then I know that it's you. No, don't you test him. We'll see that in a minute. So listen, we got to learn from the past. What Paul does is Paul reflects again on the children of Israel uh, and how they trusted God through a cloud and how they trusted God through the process to get from slavery, bondage there in Egypt, to where God ultimately wanted them to be. We don't have a whole lot of time laying on this, but the idea here, once again, is if God did it once, he's the same God then, today. He's able to do the same thing for you today. But here's the idea. You've got to keep your focus and your worship only towards him. You see, God wants all of you who profess to be his children to walk in complete obedience. 
All right, so here's the thought. So not only do we have to be mindful of our bodies that we can look at as, at, at as an icon and start worshiping it, the church, leadership, the Bible, but here's the last one I put on to your heart today. We have to be careful that we don't become the idol. Uh, that's, uh, 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 and I, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I'm talking about them, right? Them. I, I get it, I get it. Listen, listen, all of us, if we're not careful, can become victim to our own thoughts, our own ideas and, and, and concepts, as if to say, and you know, we would never say it out loud, but in our hearts, well, I came up with that. Well, I thought about that years ago. They could just listen to me years ago. I, you, know, you know, when we won't humble ourselves to learn, we have become victim to our own idea that I am better than somebody else. You see, you see here's the issue for the, the, the American church today, that we come to church Sunday after Sunday, and yet we leave with the same attitude. We come to church Sunday after Sunday, but our behaviors have not changed. So we're saying, God, I read your word. We sang your word. I prayed your word. But look at him. I'm still mad. Or I'm still whatever the situation may be. Who do we think we are to claim to be a, 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 to claim to be a part of the power of God's family, and yet we deny the power of God's family? Yes, listen, 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 listen. Before you look at somebody else, it's me, oh Lord, in the need of this understanding that sometimes the enemy is that out there. The biggest enemy for me is the enemy that's in a me. And I've got to war with Demetrius sometimes because I feel like what I think is right all the time. I feel like the process I put in place is the right process. But if it's not God's process and God's understanding, maybe I'm the issue. And I put my thoughts and myself on a pedestal where God is supposed to be. Paul is challenging the church here in Corinth to learn from the people of Israel. They loved God just as the church of Corinth said they loved God. But just like the church of Corinth, they lost their focus. And he says, verse 6, now these things occurred as examples you see that to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things so if God allowed look, look, think about this if God allowed Israel to go through this and is willing to use it as an example for us why would we be so prideful not to use God examples to help us out In Deuteronomy, Moses kept saying as he was writing this, telling people of Israel, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. And as you look at your own life and all the things you know God had to be a part of, don't you forget. Things are not as good as they are in your world just because you made the decision. No, no, no. God has been a part of all that. He has moved some of us through some open and closed doors. So don't you forget where your blessings lie. Folks that grew up with you are out of, out of their mind by now or they're even dead. But God, for some reason, has kept to you. Why? You finally desire to be kept. He said, I offer these things as examples to keep us from setting our hearts and listen God had God allowed Israel to go through this to help you and I to keep us from selling our hearts on something wrong so why don't we use it and learn from it I'm about to move on but that's the problem with our culture one of the problems with our culture is that we don't talk about the past it's 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 it's, it's dumb it's just dumb to me why they want to people want to ban certain books now, I get some books are just really off. Now, I get it. I get it. I get it. And they are not appropriate for certain ages. I, I get it. I get it. 
But when you're talking about books uh, dealing with history and the history in the book is right, why would you want to prevent anybody from learning that? I was told that if you learn the past, it'll help prevent you from repeating the same thing over and over again. So, so, so why don't we learn what God has allowed us, his people to experience? Why? So we don't repeat the same old thing. You do know that once Israel got out of there, got to the promise and they wandered for 40 years. A passage that, that should have taken them a week or two weeks to make. 40 years. Now, if you don't sell to your hips and learn from that, something's wrong with you. To keep turning their eyes on false gods. 40 years. What should have had, they should have been living and enjoying a whole generation missed out on it. Don't be that generation, y'all. Jot down in your notes, um, Exodus 20, 32 and 6. This is, you can read it when you get home from one all the way down to, uh, one all the way down to, verse one down to nine. This is the episode when, when as Moses was up in Mount Sinai getting, the, getting information from God. While he was there, you all read the text, the, 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 the people of God were, were, were down below and they, they were like, well, we don't know where this fella is. He's been gone a long time. Long time. So he's been gone a long time. So, we, so what we're going to do, we're we, we going to celebrate uh, the norm. We're going to go back to our original normal behavior, and we're going to do what we know to do. <laughs> see, see, see when, you, when you give your life to the Lord, but your mind is not right, you can be saved. I'm not, I'm not challenging nobody to salvation. You can be saved, but you are going backwards, right? So now that I am a believer, I'm not going to go back and do the things um, prior to salvation. So anything I do now as a believer, it has to be something yielded by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't go back and do nothing from the past. Absolutely nothing. Right? So what do they do? They ask Aaron, Moses' brother, little brother. They got a little brother Moses. Why don't we, uh, won't you make us a God? Right? Uh, and so what, what did Aaron do? He wasn't focused either. That's a whole issue with leadership. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, he wasn't focused. So he had, bring me all your gold. He melted it and he made an idol for the people. You see, the people wanted to see something. Because if they saw something, it will remind them of God. If they, if they saw a symbol, it would remind them of the goodness of God. Listen, listen, don't, 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 be, don't be sacrilegious like that. Uh, what, 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 we don't need a symbol to remind us of what we know God has done. Listen, far bigger than what God has done, we don't need a symbol to remind us to know who God is. You see, if we're not careful, we'll be those folks who react to whatever God does next. No, no, no. If he doesn't do anything else, just knowing that he is God and he's God all by himself, that ought to be good enough for you. Because he may not remove the mountain. He may not remove the valley, but you know what he will do? He'll be there with you, and he will be your strength to overcome the mountain and go through the valley. Listen, they replaced God with a token. As if the value of the gold of the symbol matched the value of who God is and what he has done for them. Listen, don't you value up your stuff and devalue the God who gave it to you. Don't you value up God's provisions and you devalue the provider. Don't you down, uh, value up who you are knowing that God made you that person. God put you there and you devalue him. You better learn how to learn from the past. So that we don't repeat anything that's wrong to God. Listen, verse number seven says this. Do not be, everybody say idolaters. All right. As some of them were. 
as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So not only should we learn uh, from the past, we ought to learn from examples. So, so, so we, we, we read the passage of there. Uh, we talked about that Exodus 32. That's, that's there where uh, they were, uh, Moses was on the mountain and, and God speaks to him. They bring, he comes down with the Ten Commandments while he was up there. The children of, of Israel, they, 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 were, they were taking him too long, so they had their own little party. As a matter of fact, uh, Moses, they heard a sound coming from the camp. And the text says it sounds like the war cry. But once they got down to the camp, it wasn't a war cry. It was a, it was a, it was a sound of praise that was now given to an idol image. Man, listen, listen, listen. I know some of y'all really love secular music. I get it. Secular. That was a little joke. Boy, y'all short head running preacher. I know y'all love secular music. Listen, do you not know that all music sounds the same? It all sounds the same, right? You, you, you even have secular artists singing Christianized music, right? You even have Christians singing secular music. We just change the words a little bit. You know, we just sort of make it, make it um, okay for the church folks to swallow it, you know, because some of y'all get all up in arms. You make it swallow, you know. So, 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 so listen, don't allow the small conversation regarding secular music and sacred music to distract you from the real issue. The real issue on everything is man's heart. You see, we can major on a whole lot of minor stuff and we build a whole doctrinal statement on things that matter not in the scriptures. We make an end. We have a whole convention and conference. Oh, uh, you know, uh, if, if you believe in, uh, in, in how you believe about the last days. Well, I mean, come on, just be ready, you know. Because <laughs> you can get so lost and confused on, well, do you believe in that? No, no, just, just give your life to Jesus and just be ready. We don't know when it's coming. You don't know when you're going to die. Just, just be ready. But we, but we can major on a whole lot of minor stuff. And in us majoring on minors, we are confusing those who really want to know the truth. Confusing people. They really want to understand who God is. And we're trying to tell folks, don't you wear, make sure your skirt it goes down past your ankles. I mean, people really want to understand who God is, what the word of God is saying, and how, is, how are the scriptures applicable for me in 2024? They want to know those things. Well, no, well, well I, no if it's a woman that's a pastor, I ain't going to that church. I mean, come on, y'all. I mean, you can have all the doctrine and theological thoughts you want, but at the very end of the day, who cares? There in um, Numbers chapter 25, Paul alludes to this in this conversation. We, we know that in 25, um, that's when Israel uh, begins to intermarry. Um, um, and they give in to uh, those who worship um, Baal of Peor. And they're intermarrying with people who, who don't own their God to be God. And so instead of God being able to pour out blessings upon them for being his people, the scriptures say that God actually poured out his anger on them. 
in Numbers 24, verses 4 through 9. You can go from 1 all the way down through 9. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 there is an issue going on with that King Agag. The text says the prophecy of one whose hearts, who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who, f- who falls prostrate, and whose eyes are open. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel. Verse 6, like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. Their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. They have, they have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones in pieces. With their arrows, they pierce them like a lion. They crouch down, lie down like a lioness who dares to rouse, to rouse them. May those who bless you be blessed and those who curse you be cursed. Paul says this in between verses 7 and, and, and 10, uh, he says, clearly to us and to the church of Corinth, don't become idolaters. Don't replace God with anything else. Don't even replace God with his blessings. Never forget who it is who brought you and kept you. I tried the balcony, the balcony, I said it again. Never forget who it is who brought you and who's keeping you right now. The danger for us even here in in America is that we so soon forget how far we have come as a culture, as a society, as a nation. Let's bring it a little bit closer. It's, It's right here in America that we forget as a church culture how far we have come. As God's people in this particular world, And if we take our eyes off of God being our provision, our provider, we'll find ourselves locking eyes and hearts with people who are not for God. This interlocking, intermarrying piece is is for right in verse in chapter number 25 was literally about marriage. A man from Egypt getting together with a woman outside of Egypt. Or a woman from Egypt getting together with a man out of one of the Moabites outside of Egypt. That was a very live picture because what that meant for that culture is now the normalcy of marriage has now been interjected with everything else. Because marriage, the family was the center of it all. So if, they, if we could interject itself into the core of the community by being a part of the marriage, it's now with everything else. Listen, listen, lean in. That's, that's a picture even of our culture today. How we have renamed and defined marriage. So now we are up to marrying, becoming yoked with, partnering with all kinds of systems, ideas, and new definitions. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go there Sunday morning. I know it's a political time of the year. It's political. And I'll challenge everybody. If you call yourself a Christian... And y'all, I, listen, I've heard a lot of preachers say a whole lot of stuff from pulpits like this one. I read an article this past week that one guy said, if you vote Democratic, you're not a Christian. He was a preacher. I heard another preacher say, well, you, if you vote Republican, something wrong with you, you're not a Christian. All right. Can we settle the argument among dummies? So here, here's the truth. God is not a Republican. God is not a Democrat. God is God. I'll say it one more time, Ricky. I'm going to say it one more time. Okay. God is not a Republican. God is not a Democrat. God is God. Well, I'm, I'm going to say, say it one more time. God is not a Republican. God is not an independent. God is not a Democrat. God is God. Now listen. 
for what you believe and how the scriptures read to you is the only way you can make a decision however you decide to go. Because there is not anything that all that the Democratic Party believes that I believe in everything they stand for. There's not everything I stand for believe about the Republican Party or the Independent or the Green Party. So that means I have to make a, better, a decision based on my understanding of God's word and how whoever I vote for, I have to know they bring all that with them. So it's my prayer that weight comes off your shoulders a little bit because you, you don't want to be yoked with anything that's outside of God. Now, here's, here's the problem. When you declare who you are yoked with, you have now limited your ability to evangelize. Once you declare anything outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have just shut the ears off to a certain demographic of people. So how about since... Christ is what it's all about. How about we lean on Christ and let everybody else lean on who they want to be, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Company, all that kind of stuff. Because we got to be very careful about who we yoke with. So that means some of us really have to go and do some practical work on our social media platforms. Because we know who you are based on your platform. So I have already made a decision if I want to listen to you because I've seen your platform. And you may have a wonderful testimony to give me. But because you have mis you misused the platform, I don't have an ear to hear what you have to say. If it's about Jesus, we got to make some changes. If it's about the, the, the platform of God being elevated, we've got to make some changes. That's how we know we are full of ourselves. Because we won't make the change that we can change right now. So finally, maybe, verse number 12 says this. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. <laughs> Let me read it again. So if you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. All right. See, I believe God's word is just strong enough sometimes just reading it ought to call something to happen on the inside. So, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Boy, wow, this is some good stuff. So, so here's, here's my final thought. Uh, how do we prevent our knowledge from becoming our normal? Uh, learn from God's faithfulness. So we're able to learn from the past. Learn from examples. Now let's learn from God's faithfulness. So, 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 so think about it like this. I, I believe that part of the problem with the uh, American Christianized church is we don't know conviction versus gas. I'm going to say it again. Part of the problem is we don't know conviction from gas. I know I lost some of y'all. Come on back in here with me. Come on. Come on back in the room. Come on back in the room. Come on back in the room. You, you see, see, see. Um, if we, when we normalize idolatry, we also have become, or becoming rather, desensitized to conviction. I'll say it again. Well, we normalize what we want to do. 
no matter what it is, we are desensitizing ourselves from the conviction that comes through the Holy Spirit. And so you ask me, well, Mac, how do you know that? I'm glad you asked. Because when our children sign up for extracurricular activities at school, we say, okay, let me make it work with our schedules. But when the church offers something, we got to pray about it. Desensitized. We don't recognize conviction versus gas. Because we, we, we yield ourselves to all kinds of thoughts and ideas that have no eternal value. But if you're a part of a church and at least trying to offer something, then you gotta go gotta go pray. Well, let me make sure I can do that because I don't want to sign up for it if I can't be totally committed, because you know I'm a committed person. I mean, we make excuses for everything dealing with anything godliness, but when it comes to buy another car, you know you there comes a month you may not be able to make that note, but you you still buy it. You didn't pray about that one, but I got I to gotta pray. I got to pray about this, because if I sign up for Bible study, I want to make sure, because I want to show everybody that I'm thankful for the Bible study. So no longer do we understand God convicting us. We just want to be, we are now moved by how we feel. And that's what gas does for all of us. Gas alerts you and reminds you of what you just ate. That's all it does. That's all it does. It helps you get out of your system what ought not be there. That's all it does. I had a friendship, but Mac, I got gas in my shoulder. How do you get gas in your shoulder? I don't know. I just, you, 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 just, you just doing wrong things, just all bad stuff. And all gas does is remind you what you put in your system. That should not be there, and it's is there to help you get it out. Listen, so instead of giving in to gas, how about just give in to the conviction of the Holy Spirit? That's what conviction, the conviction alerts you of everything that you have allowed in your system that should not be. And God offers us an opportunity to get it out. Look at the text. I'm not making it up. He says, here, look at it, look at it. Look at it. He, 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 said, he said, no temptation has overtaken you. Except what is common to mankind. So get this. Listen, I know all of us think that we're overly authentic. There's, we, there's a part to who we are is the fact that God has made all of us different. We all have a different imprint of our, our, our fingerprints. But when it comes to temptation, there is nothing that you are going through that I'm not going through. Every temptation is a common thing. And I get it, I get it. You have gone further than I have, so your temptation may be heavier for where you are, but for where I am, it's just as heavy for me. So Paul says, he said, he said it's, it, it's, it's common to mankind to go through temptation. Many of us want God to take us away from temptation. Listen, it, temptation is not the problem. It's not the problem. But the problem is whatever I've already turned my eyes and heart to. Because the old hymn writer said, yield not to temptation. You see, it's when I give in to that temptation that now I'm actually participating in sinful behavior. You see, because temptation for you may not be temptation for me. And temptation for me may not be temptation for you. So it's not saying, Lord, take us away from temptation. No, we have to deal with that. That's a part of life. It's common for us. But he also says this, and God is faithful. All right, all right. So if you think you are standing strong, be careful that you don't fall. Paul says this to open a verse number 12. Because the church of Corinth had everything working for them. We've all, we're in chapter 10. We already discussed some stuff. All the spiritual gifts were at work in the church of Corinth. This was not a poor community. This was a vibrant community. They had everything looking out. Everything was good for them. Paul said, listen, don't get caught up in pride. Because your pride is not going to allow you to stand when temptation, when your temptation comes. Did you hear what I said? 
your, your strength in your own ability is not going to be strong enough to give you what you need to stand when your particular temptation comes. And only you know what your particular temptation is. And when it comes, it's not pride that, that's going to help you. But you know what will help you? The faithfulness of God. All right, all right. We're, we're, we're almost done now. That's my first one. He, he says, no temptation has overtaken you beyond, uh, overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. There, God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, y'all, let me ha hang my hat right here because we've got to deal with something because we've been um, saying a, uh, quoting a lie uh, in the American church for a while because we'll say the Bible says God never put more on you you can handle. That's not what, that's not what the text says. That's, that's not what the Bible says. All right. Yeah, look at it again. Make sure we're reading it together. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When we spend time with God, God alerts us where our true motives and inspiration is. Right? So when it becomes knowledgeable for us, when we understand the things that Paul says that so easily beset me, beset us. He, he said, w when I have understanding of that, there is nothing of this common world that can get me off my target of Christ. Yeah. Because my eyes are on his faithfulness. Yeah. So, 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 so when I try to win over temptation in my own strength, I will fall every time. When I try to win over temptation in my own brain knowledge, I start quoting some scriptures and reading some philosophies, I'm messing it up because that's not going to be enough. The only thing that we have and all that we need is to lean on the faithfulness of God. So he said he would not let me be tempted beyond what, what you can, what I can bear but when we are tempted he will also provide a way out so that we can endure all right all right so so so, here, here, here. so, so instead of praying for God to get you out <laughs> look, look, okay, look at me look at me because some of y'all praying for God give me a way out Lord you whole wrote a song about it give me a way out Jesus no 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 there are some things that God wants you to hang therein. <laughs> you see, you see, you see, when we hang in there, God starts revealing things to us. Not about them, but about me. Now, here's the reality. When God reveals, I can't turn from his revelation. I've got to honor what he's revealing to me about me. He says that he will provide you a way out so that you can endure. He doesn't give you a way out for you to run out the door. But he gives you a way out to endure. And some of y'all thought you can come to church Sunday after Sunday and, and sometime in a sermon get a, get a free pass and go ahead and run. No, 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 no. The only thing we run from, according to what Paul says, is sin. You know, but we don't run from the test. There are some things that we've got ourselves into because of our own bad decisions. And God is not going to release us until we get that part right. He gives you everything you need to endure while you're in the testing season. If you don't believe me, let's go back to Genesis. God says to Abraham, now I know that you really do trust me. You had an opportunity to, to turn from me and do something different, but now I know for sure. My friends, it ought to be what we want God to say for all of us. That because we have tested and tested well, God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right, listen, I, I'm almost done. Look, 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 look at the text. He says, he says, he says, verse 13, no temptation. Everybody say no temptation. Now listen, temptation um, does not come from the devil. Temptation does not come from the devil. 
temptation is something that's already in us because it's whatever I see that I want that I know I should not want. James says it well, that God does not tempt us, but we are tempted by our what? Our own evil desires, right? So, 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 so I, I know Fit Wilson said the devil made me do it. Some of y'all too young, y'all know who Fit Wilson is. No, the devil didn't make us do it. There's something in us that we're naturally drawn to certain things. And it's that thing that you must be aware of. So when it shows itself, it, show, it rams its head, you say, ah, oh, God's given me the power to endure this. No, no. She can stand in front of me all she wants to. I'm not looking again. God's given me the power to endure. You can put 15 fried, good-looking fried leg, chicken legs on the table. I'm not looking again. So it's giving me the power to endure. No, what, no matter what is it, as comical as it may be or as heart-wrenching as it may be, God has given you his power because he's faithful in his strength to allow you to endure. He said, he said no temptation is overtaking me what is common to man. God is faithful. Faithful meaning that God is, 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 is worth the trust. <laughs> no. God is, he's trustworthy. He's dependable. He is leanable. That in the midst of your issue, you can lean on him. He's trustworthy. He's not going to bow and break, but he stands firm. You can, tr- you can rely on that. Solomon says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. You can lean on him when everybody else breaks and gives out. You know who's standing there? The faithful God. When nobody else answers the phone, you know who answers? You are faithful God. When nobody else comes to your rescue, do you know who's already there? Your faithful God. Great he is. He is. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. When mother and father forsake me, he's there and he picks me up. When my wife don't like me, when, when your husband don't like you, God is still. He's faithful. And y'all, it's the dependency of his faithfulness that keeps us going. It's the dependency on his faithfulness that allows us to endure even in the hard seasons of life. Not great is my faithfulness, but great is his faithfulness. He's a faithful God. He won't allow any temptation to come upon any of us that's beyond his faithfulness to allow us to endure. I'll say it again. No temptation will come on any of us that's stronger than his faithfulness that we can endure. I cannot, you cannot endure on your own strength, but we lean on the faithful ability of who God is to be that consistent source that my grandma would call it leaning post that we can lean on at any day any time of the day and he's steadfast and he is firm because he is faithful that's why paul will go along later on he say he'll tell the church of corinth be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the lord for your labor is not in vain can we close right here this morning that some of us have been on the struggle bus trying to figure out God how long must we endure but on the struggle bus trying to ask God questions Lord how long do I have to go through this how long must I sit through this how long, how long must I cry through this how long must I suffer all I want you to know is what Paul said to the church that your God is faithful you may not be able to depend on the pastor but you can show up depend on God you may not be able to depend on your friends. You sure can depend on God. You may not be able to depend on yourself. But you sure can depend on God because he is faithful. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. So instead of me trying to pray my way out of it, 
So let me try to pray some help to come down from somebody to call me or, or send me some money. No, 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 no. I don't have to wait on all that. God has already provided for me and for you the supernatural help that we need to endure. See, I'm not trying to get out of the race. I just need some power to endure. I'm not throwing in the towel. I just need some supernatural power to help me. Help me along the way. I'm not trying to get out of what I'm going through. I just have to learn to lean and depend on the supernatural help. And I don't know about you, but I don't mind calling out the power. The power and the faithfulness is in God and God alone. It's, it's not in my ability to think, not in my ability to work with my hands, but my faithfulness is not in myself, but I have all faith in God. The writer of Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So I might not be able to see God working it out right now. I might not be able to understand everything that he's doing, but I have faith in God. I might not understand all of why I'm still going through what I'm going through, but I have faith. I have faith in God that what God has placed me in, he is able to keep me. That what God has placed me in, he is able to keep me. That whatever trauma I'm going through, he's able to keep me. That whatever I've been doing right now, he's able to keep me. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. He's able to keep me in perfect peace. If I keep my mind stayed on him. Is there anybody here this morning? You're no longer going to be a church that worship idols. But we're going to turn our eyes on the Lord. And whatever the Lord says, it is so. However the Lord leads me, I will endure. I will endure through all that goes on because God is faithful. And the reason why we can lean on his faithfulness is because early. I feel my Baptist roots. Early Sunday morning, he rose. Yeah, he rose. Yeah, he rose with all power in the palm of his hands. I thank God that he's faithful. I thank God that I don't have to lean on myself. But the God who kept the church of Corinth is the same God who will keep you and I in his perfect peace because he is faithful. Now here's the question of the morning. Will you lean on his faithfulness today? Or will you trust your own thoughts, your evil desires? Or will you trust him today? Nothing can happen in your world that God doesn't already know about. So when life happens, because your life is life, and when life happens, will you lean on the dependability of God, his faithfulness? Or will you trust your understanding and possibly your lack of understanding? The church of Corinth had a decision to make. Will they lean on their, themselves? Or will they trust God? That's a question you have to ask and answer this morning. Will you trust him on today? Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, I to thee. So, Father, we thank you that you are the faithful God. And we lean on your faithfulness. 
with your hearts open to him there are questions you have even today the challenge for you is will you depend on God's faithfulness or will you try to figure it out on your own you need help we have to turn from these idols the idols of our flesh the idols of our hearts the, high, the idols of our philosophy our thinking because it's Christ and Christ alone not Christ and baptism not Christ and church membership but Christ and Christ alone you see because when I become discipled by Christ by the Holy Spirit and his word I'll just do right because I've learned as a learner disciple to do right according to God's scriptures so we don't have to be convinced anymore we don't have to be convinced what the word says we'll just do because God you have shown yourself to be God so in the sweetness of this moment if you know him as your Lord and Savior but you have not been as obedient as you know you should nobody's watching trying to see who raises their hand this is between you and God your testimony is at stake is it worth more for people to know your opinion about politics and stuff or do they need to know that you know God what is the most valuable thing about you And as his children, the most, most important, valuable thing about us is that we are his. And we depend on him. He's faithful. What's your response to his faithfulness? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. That's what he means to us. Morning by morning.